the courage, and our aim is to please God. So that will be today's message. Not just that we be people who are of good courage, that we walk by faith and not by sight, but we're courageous. We are. Uh, we take great risks and faith with an aim that we please God. And how do we live this way? Paul encourages us here in, in <coughs> chapter 5 that the reason why we can be people that are courageous, the reason why we can live by faith and not by sight, uh, he's speaking to a church that, again, they're, they're in turmoil. There's there's people that are against them. There's there's violence that is promised to their name, right? There, there's, there's threats to their very life and their very breath. And in, in, these, in that situation, Paul encourages them, know that you have a promise that is being prepared for you. There is a place, there is an internal dwelling that the Lord has for you. And so if you are a person of faith, if you have put your trust in Jesus, then whatever threat is coming your way, whatever situation, whatever is around you, it, it has no effect on you. Your eternal dwelling place is already secure. Your future is safe. It can't be taken away from you. It was purchased by the blood of Jesus, and it's prepared. I love that that encouragement from last week. It is prepared by God Himself. God Himself is preparing a place just for you. And so, with that promise, with that truth, with that reality within us, now we can be a people who walk by faith and not by sight. Now, life. My breath, it doesn't even matter because the reality we're going to look at, the reality is that, hey, if I want to be absent from the body, I want to be what? I want to be with the Lord. I want to be in His dwelling place. So no matter the situation, no matter the threat, no matter what it looks like, no matter the risk that it's going to, it's going to cost, I'm secure. I, I can walk this out. I can live for Jesus Amen. courageously. Second Corinthians here, chapter 5, let's read it again, verses 1 through 10. It says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in the tent, we groaned, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, and again, that's not that we would die, but that we would further be clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Our hope is not in everything ending. Our hope is not in death. Our hope is in the fact that there is eternal dwelling place prepared for us. It's a hope that we will be swallowed up by life eternal with our Father. In verse 5 it says this, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. <coughs> For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We are always of good courage. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. Amen. Right before these verses, as I reflected on it, if I'm not supposed to walk by sight, how? What is? What is this? What does this look like in verse uh, number eighteen of? chapter 4, sorry, we're going to start in verse 17 of chapter 4. It, it, again, 
Paul begins to speak towards this blindness in which we're supposed to, or this focus, what is our focus supposed to be if, if uh, we are not supposed to walk by our sight, not walk by what we know, walk, not walk by what's familiar to us. In verse 17 of chapter 4, it says this, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Real, real briefly here, the trials and the things that God is asking us, the sacrifices we are making for Him, the, the efforts in which we are living our life to please God rather than to please our flesh or to please others, these are just, it's just a momentary thing. It's just a slight weight compared to the eternal glory that we are to receive on the other side. In verse 18 it says, As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. So here it is. What, what are we supposed to be looking at? If we're not supposed to be looking at the things that are seen, if we're not supposed to be uh, focusing our eyes and, and, and concentrating on everything, what is this life? Uh, how are we supposed to live? How is, what is faith going to look like? This is what it says here. For the things that are seen are transient. What does mean? The things that are going on around us, the things that we can put our eyes on, our focus on, they're tra they change. They shift. They, 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 tomorrow is going to be different. Yesterday was different. Right now, it, it, it's transient. But this is what it says. But the things that are unseen are eternal. So how are we supposed to walk this life? What are we supposed to walk out in faith? It says that the things that are unseen, they are eternal. What are the eternal things? It's the souls of men and women, go on forever, God himself and his word. And his word. And so if we're going to be people who we're going to get to, that we aim to please God, we have to be people who are stuck on, who are focused on, who live our life on the things that are eternal. God himself, all that is revealed about who he is through his word and the souls of men and women. So if we look back down, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith in the eternal things, the things that we can't see, the things that won't change. Like last week, we, we affirm that God's word it always produces what he says he's going to produce. Yes. And so we can stand firm on these things. We can build our life on these things because they're never going to change. We can look around the room. I love having a, a, a diverse and aged church. All right, so we can look at the, the young kids that were up here uh, earlier. Right, they're just full of energy. I went outside, uh, you know, I'm, I'm even young uh, compared to some of our um, wise people in the church. And, you know, I went outside and played a snowball fight and built a snowman with Denver. I could only last about an hour. It was, and my muscles, that was Friday afternoon. My muscles yesterday, my muscles today, they're all feeling all these different things that I haven't, I haven't used, right? Like, like, if we put our faith or we build our life on our own abilities, that I think there's some people in the room that would agree, those things are transient. Those things change. They're, they're maybe what I once could do, I, I can't do anymore. They, if I put it on my skills, if I put it on my wages, if I put it on my spouse, if I put it on my friends, if I put it on my employment, it doesn't stand. It doesn't remain. It, it, it shifts. It changes. Life happens. Sicknesses. Deceit. Those are the groanings. Those are the burdens that, that, that Paul was describing here. But the thing, if we set our eyes on the things that are eternal, we choose to have a ground that yes. is never going to shift. It's, it's not going to change. His word it doesn't, it's going to be a solid foundation for us to, to live on. And we can live courageously. We can live risky. We can live to, and we can aim to please God because we know, hey, this is 
is not going to change. He's not going to change the rules tomorrow. He's not going to. He's not going to shift what he's commanding of us. No, he, he's not going to change what we what we did. Our, our eternal reward is already secure. It's already set up for us. The dwelling place is it's already there. It's not going to change. And so now, all of a sudden, I can take risks as I aim to please Him. And I know that He's not going to change His perspective on me. He's not going to change what I want to receive. He's not going to change who he is. He's going to remain the same. As I was thinking about this for my life in, in, in this church, I said, man, yeah. there are things that God is calling us to, to do for him. There's risks that he's calling us to take. There's faith steps that he's calling us to take him because I know he doesn't change. He's always the same. And I'm willing to I'm willing to get out and get get dirty. I, I'm willing to, hey, who knows? If we if we start shifting the way we spend money where we're not worried about this building and this building collapses. That's all right. He remains the same. He, his word is true. The souls of men and women, they're going to be here for eternity. And I think it's our, our task as a church, I think it's a task as a pastor in this community that we focus on the souls of men and women and his word. And, and whatever else happens, it, it's okay. We are secure in him. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight. As we continue in, he has this bold statement here of, of being of good courage, that he would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord, right? He, there's, these, there's these statements here that there is this tension that builds inside of him that he wants to be away, he, he wants to be in that dwelling place, but also knowing that, hey, there is a current uh, job for him to do. Right after this, I mean, that was, I'm not even doing my notes today. That's all right. Right after this, what Paul, what, what Paul encourages us is to be people who preach the word. Did you that? This is the result. This, this, is where, this is where this passage is heading. Right? Uh, it's so hard for me, guys. I, I want to... I, I, I'll just be... Just being Andrew here for a moment. Right? I'll, pastor. Pastor's up there. I'm, I'm here. I'm Andrew. Right? As I'm, as I'm reading this passage uh, over again this week, right? I've been reading this now. That's November, I think, was when the first time I mentioned something. Like, What's the new year going to be? I said, oh, it's gonna, we're going to walk by faith and not by sight. I read it again this week. And it's so hard for me at times. This morning, uh, uh, you know, I, I was doing the sound this morning, right? And I, I greeted quite a few of you guys at the door this morning. I printed the bull, bull, bulletin this morning. I printed the bulletin this morning. I noticed that the door was dinged this morning. And I'm like, oh, got to go fix the door. Came inside here. It was a little cooler than it should be. I said, all right, I got to open up the app on my phone. And I changed it. And I'm preparing this sermon. And... and even some of the notes that I wrote for this morning, I was like, all right, I'm going to encourage the church. Like, hey, let's do some things. Like, let's go to do the sound next week. Because I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be back there. This is Andrew speaking, okay? Who's going to greet people at the door? Because I'm not going to do that next week. And I'm going to say, all right, we're going to live courageously. All right, we're going to take some risk. There's things that need to be done that, that, that we need to do. I'll say it like that, right? That we need to do in order to have a church that continues to to, to welcome people in, yeah. continue to be a family. Whenever we gather, uh, I don't know. I was preparing some notes here. I was like, you know, whenever we come together as a family, my family all lives in town, and when we have holidays, you know, we assign. All right, who's bringing this? Who's doing this? We're all we all get together. So then we show up, and and everything is done. And, you know, I, I prepared some notes to say like, hey. Let's come together, let's do some things. There's some things that need to be done. So I'll just say that. But you want to know what the Word of God says? That because we have this promise, 
because we have faith that 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 our dwelling place is complete that God has prepared for it it doesn't say so show up early at church on Sunday so that you can vacuum and there's not salt everywhere on the uh, on the floor it doesn't say um, because you have this great and awesome promise uh, you can you can be a sound guy even if you have no skills it doesn't say uh, that you could uh, that you could set up the camera in a balanced way uh, so that it's nice and even and so everybody can see the message you know what the result of this is I'm going, to, I'm going to read scripture a little bit more than, than preach my notes. So this is verse 11. Let's go to verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What is Paul saying here? So it's really good. It's really exciting. All this, all this sermon last week, uh, up to this point in, in today, it's super exciting that we have an eternal dwelling place prepared for us. But with this knowledge, that's what it's saying, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing that he's going to judge, that he's going to set up a judgment, a judgment seat, and that, that he's going to judge people whether they've done good or whether they've done evil, and he's going to have a reward for those who have done good, come and dwell with me forever. For those who have done evil, perish. Because we know this, because they're the promise, and, and we as the people, we rejoice. Wow, dwelling place. It's exciting stuff. This is what Paul says. We persuade others. That's my only call thing. That's my only goal. We persuade others. What are the things that are eternal? I purposely did that. I, I know, maybe I could be a, you know, a better theologian to say God first and his word first. The souls of men and women are eternal. And so we rejoice in this moment. We're like, yeah. I know that because I want to live forever with him. Amen. Paul saying the reality is, yes, you get an eternal dwelling place, but there's thousands, millions, yes. worldwide, billions yes. of individuals when they stand at that place in front of the throne of God. And they're going to be judged for the things that they've done. And they're going to be found evil. So this is, this is the result. This is what Scripture says. And I still want you to do all this stuff around here. But this is what it says. <laughs> but what we are is known to God. And I hope that it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. If we live courageously, if we go into the craziest parts of Madison, which, come on, if we're honest, they're not really that crazy. If we're, they would do stupid risks for Jesus, if we get stoned for Jesus, if they throw us in jail for Jesus, if we do these weird things, we just stand up for Jesus, he, he says, um, if we're besides ourselves, it's for God. It's for his sake. It's for the sake of the kingdom. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. There is a proper way, there is an acceptable way to go and share Jesus with others. Hey, we'll learn that together, we'll walk with that together. Um, but it's for God. For the love of Christ controls us. 
Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him this no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Right? We rejoice in the fact that when we put our faith in Christ, we have become new. Man, the, the old things about us, the, the old sins, the, it's all gone away with Christ died once and it took care of all of it. Praise the Lord, right? Hallelujah. And so, the old has passed away and the new has come. Verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ Jesus was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Yeah. So, because we have this dwelling place that's prepared for us, because there is a promise of eternity with them, because there is a, a, a judgment seat where both the good and the evil will be judged, uh, we're going to persuade other people because verse because he has taken care of all of the sins, he has made everything new, he has reconciled the world to himself. Verse 20, again, here's this, this oh, answer, what is the Bible telling us to do? Somebody's going to read it next week, but there's also going to be, verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're his representation. We're his messengers. We're the ones that are sent on his behalf. We are sent. All of us in this room. That's why I could just preach down here. I'm just, I'm just like one of you guys. We're all sent as ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. Why are we here? What is our purpose for remaining here? not in the dwelling place with him forever. Our purpose, right here, this is what scripture says, is that we would be the ambassadors. That we are the ones making the appeal on God, come to Jesus. Come taste and see what he's like. Come and, and, and get your eternity secure. Come to Jesus. We're the ones making this appeal over and over again. Verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. What's the end goal of, of Paul's message to the church? Live courageously. Bring up Jesus. Invite people into the kingdom. Invite people into the family. Invite people into the church. Invite people. Our main goal, Paul says, Paul says the reason why it became his main goal is because Christ's love so compelled him. Father, forgive me that I have not recognized how great your love is for me. How great your love is for me. How big of a gap? I, I had us kind of jokingly raise our hand if we were raised in church, and sometimes I forget that even though I had awesome parents, and even though I probably attended every church service there's been since the day I was born, even though I'm a vacation, we went to another church building, right? Christ loved me, and there was a gap between me and my Heavenly Father that had to be bridged. And because he loved me that much, now, but as, I, as I recognize it, Lord, I ask that you would increase our revelation of how great you loved us, because now I see that great love, Paul says, it compels me. 
I've got to tell other people about it. I, I, I abandoned myself. I, I, I lose control of myself. I, I set aside my goals. I set aside my, my privileges. I set aside what I'm comfortable with. Why? Because Christ's love so compels me to yes. go. Amen. To make the appeal. Mm -hmm. Tell other people to take risks, to live by faith, to not by sight. God is moving us as a church. Uh, and I know maybe sometimes when I talk about the finances of the church, it makes people uncomfortable. But hey, if 4% of, 1% uh, of our budget went to outreach oriented things, I said, man, this, guy, this has to change. I talked about offering the changing those fees. Man, that little bit would be would double what we gave would get gave last year. Actually, it would quadruple what we gave last year uh, it, towards outreaches, towards helping people come to Christ. This, this is the type of thing. This type of risk God is, is saying we can take. What 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 measure of time is He asking you to give so that other people can can know Christ? And it's uncomfortable to think about. I like chilling out and relaxing. Who likes chilling out? Don't make people. Mm -hmm. you know, yesterday, my schedule was not geared towards chilling out and relaxing. <laughs> because I'm starting to, I'm starting to see this, and I'm like, I gotta change the way. I gotta change even what I like. I gotta be willing to change what's comfortable for me. Yes. Because there's going to be people that's going to stand before that judgment seat. And, and I feel pretty confident. I have faith in Christ and that, that he's going to cover me. And God's going to look at me and see his righteousness. But I know there's individuals. I know some neighbors. Yesterday, Denver and I went out to Milwaukee for a little um, reunion to his camp. And that was cool. And I text messaged one of my uncles. And uh, they said, uh, hey, we're going over to Grandpa. One of my... I'm, I know I'm a bad, bad grandson, but my one of my grandpa's birthday was this week. I didn't, I didn't know. Um, and so they, but they're like, we're all going over to grandpa's house. And I was like, oh, I know. I really don't want to. I really don't want to be with grandpa. I've been come on in. You guys don't know the guy. I'm sorry. It's my friend. Come on in. Kevin, there's a seat by Kevin right here. Kevin, where are you? <coughs> and so it's gonna it's gonna cost us to be a little uncomfortable. So I was like, all right, I got that. So I went over there for an hour and a half and spent time with my extended relatives because they don't know Jesus. And I'm like, I gotta spend some time with them. There's an opportunity. My my grand my grandpa's birthday. All right, I'm spending. We sat around the table. We're talking about Jesus. I brought up Jesus anytime I could, and, and they had their fun fun answers, right? And then I got home. And I wanted to rest. We got up at nine o'clock in the morning to drive all the way in the snow to New Berlin to go to the the camp thing. We spent a, two hours there with all these kids running all over the place and talking to strangers I didn't know. And then and then all right, then I'm going to spend an hour and a half with my extended relatives because they need Jesus and why not to, to talk to them about Jesus? And then we got home at four o'clock. Four o'clock, we had a birthday party for one of our neighbors, uh, our Colombian neighbors, and we went downstairs. There's about 20 people down there talking about Jesus. I'm pastor to all of them. Some of them are Catholic. We're talking about Jesus, talking about what it means to be saved. Stayed up till 9 30, 10 o'clock with them playing dominoes. I got no rest on my Saturday for me. These are the type of things <coughs> Paul's saying, for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, for the, because of what Jesus has done for us, live courageously. 
walk by faith. Set your life on the things eternal, the souls of men and women, God himself and his word. And when we do these things, when we set our eyes on those things, no matter what happens to us, God's got our back. Things are secure for us. But the reality is there's some that their future is not secure. And when they stand at that judgment seat, the reward that they receive is not an eternal security with Him. But it's a forever damnation separated from God. Paul says, let this compel you. Let this urge you on. Let this control what you do and what you don't do.
And your responsibility <coughs> in this moment, if you desire to be restored, this is what you have to do. Say, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me. And the beautiful thing that that, that, that the Bible reveals about who God is is that He forgives us. Yeah. It's not, it's not, a, not a hope that He forgives us. It's not a if we change, it's not a if everything is new, He does. No, He says He forgives us. Those that come to Him say, Lord, forgive me. And just make a decision to make Him Lord of your life, to live for Him, and then all those things will be added to you. That's the good news of who Jesus is. He's not a taskmaster. No. He, he's, not, he's not ready to, to slam us hard. No. The story of the God, the good news of Jesus is that He lifts us up. He restores us. He makes us new. Yeah. Let's take a moment this morning. And there's two ways that we can respond to this message this morning. They weren't the responses I had planned for today. The first way that we can respond to this message is if you have made a decision to follow Jesus, the first way to respond is this. Lord, help me carry your message. Yes. Help me live by faith. Help me decide that your glory, your fame, your name is greater than any security, any norm, any regular building that I have. Every You're worth it. You're worth me giving it all up for you. So that's the, that's the way. If you're a believer this morning, you say, yes, Jesus, you're my Lord. I want to encourage you to take a moment and respond and say, God, I'm willing to lay it all down, to live by faith, to live courageously, because I, I understand, I recognize that it's been revealed to me today that living for you, living for the eternal things, is greater than living for my comfort. But secondly, the opportunity today is to respond to the gospel message. If you're here this morning, you say, man, I, I have not made a decision to follow Jesus with all of my heart. I have not made a decision to follow him with everything within me. Or maybe you say, I have made a decision, but man, I, my life hasn't reflected that decision, that Jesus is my Lord. I want to take an opportunity right now to make your heart right your Heavenly Father. We just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we will all stand before God as judge. And we'll be judged for the good things and for the evil things that we have done. <coughs> difference in that moment will be whether you have been standing with Jesus or you're standing with your own account. And this morning, the invitation to each one of you this morning is to receive Jesus, to receive forgiveness, and to be made right. Trust God. God's going to do all the rest of the work. This morning, every eye 